Okay. Well, um, also, one thing I forgot was uh, if you want to be in starting point class, if you've been coming here a while, want to know more about history of our church, how to get involved, um, even we cover baptism a little bit in there. Uh, it, it's pretty interactive. If you want to be involved in that, we, we have about uh, 17 or 18 people signed up already. Get a few more and we'll set a date for that. So that's in the back as well. We're going to start our, we started our new sermon series, Tough Topics. Last week we dealt with how do you deal with sin and temptation? And we know that the Bible tells us three concrete ways we can deal with it, the way Jesus uh, dealt with it and instructed us to deal with it. Um, and a lot of times we don't take advantage of all three and that would be to fast, um, to pray, which for a lot of us is tough because it doesn't seem uh, concrete enough. But that's kind of uh, submission to God and to put him in, in front of everything. And then the third thing we need to do is learn God's word. In, in a tough topic, of an area of sin and temptation, you need to read all the Bible verses and memorize them that you can in that subject and that's one way you could def defeat um, sin and temptation. So all the things we're going to talk about, uh, is tough topics, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, um, it's going to be in summer. There's going to be a few weeks where we have, I think, less people than we will in the fall. Though, uh, one of the things that I want to bring up, I brought it up Thursday night, I'm going to bring it up again. You know, there are two weekends, typically, that church attendance suffers, and, and um one is uh, Father's Day, and the other one would be right around whatever weekend the 4th of July falls on. And there's, there's other ones, but classically, those are two uh, pretty bad ones. Now, um, what you guys might have realized on uh, day, weekends like today and, and last weekend is that, that uh, maybe there's not quite as many of the usual faces in this one. But one of the things that Thursday night has done is people, when they know they're going to miss on Sunday morning... Uh, have been coming to Thursday night, so that's been very good. And we didn't really experience a dip in overall attendance on Father's Day, and that shows a great ministry on your part and the life and the body of this church because some of the other services were able to. And also, while we were missing a lot, and this weekend I'm sure we will too, miss a lot of regular people, we are having a, a lot of new people coming in. And so that just shows that we're growing over the summer and that's an awesome thing. So one of the things that we decided to do to stop that growth right away would be do tough topics, right? So, so but you guys have, uh, it's an interactive sermon series where you can message me or ask me or talk to me or uh, text me uh, a topic that's tough for you, something that you wrestle with in your ministry, um, and so you have. And so one of the ways we're going to deal with this tough topics, just to keep it in perspective, is found in 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So how are we going to uh, address these tough topics with gentleness and respect? And so we need, we're supposed to Learn answers as we're a Christian. We're, but we don't know them all. What we do is we we scour God's Word. We learn uh, the answers and uh, to be able to ready for answers for questions that we get. And that's one of the things that we want to do at Cross the Line. So you guys have responded on one subject over and over and over. Probably two out of three. Every three comments I get back is in the area of sexual immorality. I don't think that would be much different with a youth group or any age uh, concerning the faith because uh, this is something that affects every single person at every single age. And so uh, we're going to address it this morning. It's difficult to read the Bible, hardly any of the Bible, and this subject doesn't come up. If we could do it, we can't, you can't hardly probably even look up a number count in the Bible on verses that have to do with sexual immorality because you could be reading a verse about a kingdom's rise and fall and the kingdom, uh, the leader of the kingdom, a, a servant of the kingdom, uh, a prophet, a judge uh, is dealing with this in a certain way. So it'd be, it would be almost impossible. There's just so many hundreds of verses, thousands of verses in the Bible that deal with this. Um, so it's everywhere. Uh, this subject is everywhere all the time. And so it's an important subject uh, that we get the truth on. 
I'm not sure it's a one-week subject, but I'm going to answer it with gentleness and respect uh, this, because it's a tough issue. Why is this a tough issue? Because if you've accepted Christ, not only is, does it affect your personal life, but it affects people that we love. I one time had a person uh, message me online, actually this year, uh, pretty recently, and ask me uh, some specific questions about the areas of sexual immorality. I answered them back, and the person goes, well, okay, well, I, I was just interested if you uh, loved all of God's people. P- probably answering back in a negative connotation, uh, but, but how do you love people without the truth? Right, so if I continually lie to someone over and over in their in their eternal life or physical life, like if I if I li- lied to my kids every day and said, "Oh no, you can touch the hot stove, it's no problem," and they get burnt, they would look at me and like, "Like you liar, you're mean. You wanted me to touch the stove." So here's the thing: we uh, when it talks about love in the Bible, it's talking about sacrificial love. Obviously, all the apostles, all the defenders of faith, all the preachers and teachers. Uh, that still preach the Bible have to preach it in truth and love. How how do we do that? With gentleness and respect. So I'm going to teach you three things today that our cultures teach, that our culture teaches lies about uh, when it comes to the Bible and sex. And what I want to tell you is this is not new. In fact, these lies were told more prevalent during the time of Christ that we know about than they are today in our culture. Even if you think they're getting bad and negative in our culture today, it was worse before, and it'll probably be worse in the future. But it's a serious subject, both before marriage and in marriage. In fact, there's probably as much sexual immorality that we can find in the Bible after two people are married than before, and I'm going to uh, show you two ways uh, later in the message that that's true. But many people get married to avoid sexual immorality because uh, in, in in the Bible it tells us what the what the parameters are. But before we get to that, I want to bring up the first lie that our culture tells about sexual immorality. Our, the first lie is our culture lies about gender. And this is not new to now. Almost every demonic culture that's ever been born in this earth has a symbol of Baphomet or a demonic figure. And the first thing that we see on hieroglyphs and ancient writings and current writings and every demonic thing that we can see is the command that uh, God gave in his Bible is everything would reproduce after its kind. And the first thing that Satan, one of the first things that satanic cultures do is they attack gender. They mix them and they publicize it. And so, uh, so, you know, because this this is probably not a topic that we needed to address in our culture 10 years ago, but in about the last five minutes, it's been a, a, a big deal. So Jesus actually talks about this because it was an issue in all the pagan led cultures. And you might be surprised to know that. So right off the bat, in Genesis, it says, God created them male and female in the beginning. Deuteronomy 22, 5 says, guys, don't dress like in women's clothes and women's vice versa, for it is detestable or it's an abomination in the eyes of the Lord. It's not good. So don't do those two things. So right off the bat, in the Old Testament, we have the beginning of creation, which is a literal, factual story, male and female. Okay. Then again, in the New Testament, Matthew 19.4, Uh, it quotes the Old Testament. He says, he answered and said to them, have you not read? Which he made them in the beginning, he made them male and female. Okay, now Jesus tells us that one more thing happens. A person, uh, we have some issues that come up and so I I wanna talk about that after we read Matthew 19, 11 through 12. And I'm gonna read in King James, um, just so it's uh, closer to the Greek. But he, he said unto them, not all men can receive this saying, uh, say to them who it's giving. Okay, so here, here's the thing. This is given, this teaching is given at the time of Christ. Why? There's some different rules for that. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to tell you why. But Jesus tells us not all people can hear this. Like, it's, even though it's true, it doesn't make, make it not true, but never, not everybody's going to learn this. And that's true today. Not everybody will learn this. They might uh, get saved and they might start learning, but they're, they're, it's going to be hard for some people to learn that. Is it going to be hard for some people to learn that today? It is. Okay. And he talks about this way uh, in verse 12. For there are some eunuchs 
which were born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be some eunuchs which made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. And he who is able to receive that, let him receive it. Who's able to hear this and understand it? So what's the Lord saying? Well, there's a lot of things that happen in the Bible. And if you read it carefully, it answers the question. So some people, uh, anytime when you talk about the truth of the Bible and everything will reproduce after its kind in the Old Testament, somebody said, well, yeah, well, what are people who are born and, and they don't have uh, developed parts normally? Okay, and so Jesus addresses that classification as eunuch, okay, or the language that he was using uh, covered that. And there are some people who do, let, let, me, let me just say, this happens in every area of life. We have copyist errors in our genetic code due to the fall of sin. Guess what? Some of your knees don't work right. Some of your backs don't work. Some, some, some things aren't uh, developed correctly on certain people, parts of legs and arms and hands, and so certain people don't have functions that they're supposed to have. Well, this also happens in the reproductive system sometimes, but the Lord still classifies a male and female, but it's also then eunuch, okay? And, and so that's not uncommon in our fallen state. We do have copyist errors. There's a reason, right, that you can't marry your sister, there's lots of reasons in the Mosaic Law, but you can't do that. Why? Because you have the same copyist errors. And at the time of the Mosaic Law, that became a, a not proper for God's holy people. So the, the, the culture tells us, listen, uh, there's all kinds of things going on. And the Bible says, no, there's three things going on. There's copyist error, or there are people who are made that way. In fact, if you're reading the book of Daniel and you read the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego... It doesn't specifically say this, but a lot of commentators imply because it was very common when one group uh, took over another group or, uh, or a uh, king had servants in his house that he would make them eunuchs, uh, you know. And so this was a very common thing to do back then. Gender was being smushed together because of the sinful nature of the satanic Roman gods. It was all over the streets. If you go to Israel, you can see they were worshiping the god of Pan, and, and all those images are gender confused. And so that's one of the things um, that the Bible addresses directly. Now let's back up to another issue. The Bible clearly addresses sexual immorality. Our culture, number two, our culture lies about cult. Uh, lies about scripture how does it lie about scripture well i think first it kind of tries to lie out of scripture because uh, we love people we want to make we want to make it good for people but when you go back in the old testament there are instructions for sex sex was specifically designed for marriage okay marriage was needed and some of you may not know this but the 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 intent for marriage the reason it's needed we find in luke 20, 36, if you didn't understand it from the Old Testament, you better understand it from the New Testament. The reason there is no marriage in heaven is because there is no death. The reason there is marriage on earth is because there is death. Okay, it's a pretty simple concept. Now, some people do not know that, and there's a reason God hates divorce is because marriage is the, is the direct line of Jesus is the groom and the church is the bride. Every single instruction about marriage has to do with Jesus and his church. And a lot of people make that separation. I can be married. No, listen, the only reason you're married is because there's death. And God saves the world through the marriage of Jesus and his church. Okay? So when anyone takes that out of scripture, now, they're wrong. And we can thank Adam and Eve for that and their choice. Now, God says has a lot of rules in the book of Leviticus um, and in the Torah. Uh, it just simply means instruction, okay? There are a lot of instructions from God. And everything that we know about the instructions for marriage really are based in the Old Testament and then reconfirmed in the New Testament. God says and a lot of things. Some of the things he says, I'll just list them for you. You can't marry an animal, right? You can't marry your biological sister. You can't lie with a person of the same sex or you're in trouble or your family's in trouble if you do some of these things. And he gave us rules for divorce that they never really followed and you see what happens in light of that. They always get in trouble. Now, some of the things that are listed in the Old Testament were new to that time, like um, some of the genetic things hadn't happened yet. So uh, there were massive families. There was no genetic breakdown um, until really after the flood. And so the Mosaic Law comes in and it classifies some things. 
However, some people and churches teach this, and it's wrong, it's rudimentary, it's a simple mistake, but they teach that the moral teachings of the Bible are like the sacrificial system and the unclean instructions. What do I mean? I'm going to be very specific. I want it to be concrete. They say, well, no, um, all the, the moral teachings of the Old Testament are like shellfish and eating, and eating pig and eating all this stuff. That, that stuff's all done away with because of Christ. Okay, let me just back up. Most people do not know about uh, clean and unclean food and being clean and unclean yourself. Okay, there was a sacrificial system, right? So if you had a sin in the Old Testament, every once in a while you would need to take, depending on the sin, you'd need to take an animal, grain, a dove, a, a lamb, whatever, and you'd need to take it up to be sacrificed. And you needed to make yourself clean before you did that. And there were rules and instructions. There were also animals that would make you unclean if you consumed them. Shellfish, uh, something like a catfish, a uh, pig. Uh, you can't eat a condor, stuff like that, right? An eagle. You can't eat that stuff. Why? Because uh, as the fall of man happened, animals also were affected, and they started degrading into different species that resorted to stay alive. They would eat dead things, or they would even eat other animals feces and it would make them unclean and you weren't supposed to eat those because they carried a large amount of parasites and this and that and so instead of God giving all the instructions on how to cook them and stay healthy he said they're unclean be set apart my people don't eat those and guess what if you follow the clean laws of the old testament you'll probably be healthier even today in fact, if most of the ancient world were to realize you need to quarantine and keep yourself clean when people get sick, a lot of the ancient stuff that has taken down mass populations would not have happened, but they ignored the Bible, they threw it away, and they thought they knew better. And we do the same thing today, by the way. The reason you can eat a clean or unclean animal is because at the time of Christ, um, a lot of those same animals, right, would now be considered unclean that were clean before. But Jesus told us that the things that make you clean before God, do, do not, they're not found, um, you know, on your body anymore. They're found with what comes out of the heart, okay? So Jesus makes us clean before God. It, he, take, he takes the place of clean and unclean. Now, are some things bad for you? Is McDonald's worse than a natural organic salad out of the ground of course it is but uh before god you're not made clean and unclean through this uh sanctimony kind of ceremony process where i dip myself in water and all that stuff there are a lot of ways you could be unclean in the old testament i mean even if you had normal sexual relations with your wife you were unclean for a certain period of time if you had a certain sickness you were unclean if you touched a dead person you were unclean for a certain period of time that's not true. Now you're clean before God because of the blood of Christ, okay? Understand that maybe. If you need to ask questions later, go ahead. There's also um, the ceremony kind of stuff, right? So you have clean and unclean animals, and you're clean and unclean. And so there are a lot of things that you need to do to be clean. But uh, not only do you not need to go prepare a sacrifice before the Lord for sin, but you can't make yourself any cleaner than God's already made you. So those two things are fulfilled in Christ, but moral law has always stayed the same. In fact, every single time that the Bible refers to sexual immorality, it is referring to the list in the Torah of instructions about sexual morality. And anyone who tells you different is lying to you. They have no basis for it. In 1 Corinthians, by the way, some people go, we need to get back to the early church. Not the early church in Corinth. It was the most corrupt that I can see in the New Testament. So there are a lot of instructions about sexual immorality. Why? Because there was a lot of sexual immorality in that church, in that place. That, it was just a center uh, for this, and so you, you might recognize it. It's uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 5. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication... Let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise the wife to the husband. Now, I'm going to teach you something that you may or may not heard, but I said something earlier that is true. There is much sexual immorality, breaking of sexual moral instructions in the marriage than outside the marriage. Here's why. <clears throat> let the husband re render unto the wife due benevolence. Benevolence, and likewise also the wife to the husband. The wife have no power over her body but the husband, and likewise the husband have no power over his body but the wife. Defraud ye 
not one another, except with consent for a time. So you're not to withhold relations from your wife or husband, except for a time that you agree on to go to the Lord in prayer. Now, this is broken all the time. What would Satan have you do in the American culture? Have all the sex outside of biblical marriage that you can, and then once you get marriage, uh, use uh, unforgiveness and power in this area and disobey God over and over. His instructions for sexual morality, uh, disobey that and be proud of it. And so have all be, be completely sexual before marriage, taking all this stuff and do all these things because that's exciting and that's that's the way. Well, for a moment it might be that that instant gratification is it can definitely be there, but that's not the instructions that God gives. And so uh, for a lifelong marriage, I've heard Christians, guys and girls, brag about having control over their partner by withholding. Uh, sex from them, and it's immoral. It's, it's, it's against the instruction of God. You're not to do that. Your body is not your own. It was bought at a price with the blood of Jesus, and it's just improper for God's people to act in unforgiveness and, and to do these things. And so God gives us instruction. Listen, you want to have a great, forgiving, all the fruits of the Spirit? Here are the instructions, and it's proven uh, through, I don't know how many uh, tests Barna and James Dobson have done over the last 50 years, but it's unbelievable, and the people who obey God's Word are absolutely the happiest people that there are in this area. Your body doesn't belong. You're bought as a price. Everything in the whole world and all who are in it belong to God. Don't you think he knows the best way? Well, 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 19 says, flee from sexual immorality. What's a sexual immorality? All the things listed in the Torah, okay? Every sin a person commits is outside his body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own. Okay, so if you're in Christ, you're not your own. So it's not proper to take things that are set apart and do things that aren't set apart. And this is the instruction from God. And so does this happen in the church with Christians? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And listen, it's a big deal. It's a big deal because, uh, you know, if I get give in to my anger and honk at somebody and say a naughty word behind my dashboard in my car, none of you care about that too much. I mean, you'd be like, come on, pastor, grow up, right? But, but you wouldn't care that. I wouldn't step down from leading the church. But if I was sexually immoral, I would step down. And, and, and you see that all over the country. Why? Because it's a big deal. It ruins your ministry for a period of time. It really does. It hurts the body of Christ. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 13 through 14. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord uh, for, for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. So the Lord did not mean for you to live in sexual immorality. What's sexual immorality? The things listed uh, in Leviticus and other places. Okay. The last lie I want to address is the, cu the culture is going to tell you that God made you to lust after sin. This is a lie that's been told uh, to question God. Did God made me this way? Okay, let's answer this with Scripture. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, for it is the will of God for your sanctification. Now, this is a Christianese word that I'm going to explain to you. What is sanctification? It is the process of being set apart. It's the process of being set apart and saved, okay? Can we agree on that? If you don't, I'm right, so just agree with me. You, are you sanctified? If you, someone asked you, are you sanctified? Are you saved? Are you set apart for salvation? The answer is yes. Your eternal spirit is sanctified the day you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, okay? Good, you're saved. Are you being sanctified? Okay, your soul is your heart, your emotions, all the things that you know, that's being set apart. We're not all set apart. You know why? Because we're not sin free. So we're being sanctified. And so the Holy Spirit nudges us because it is the very will of God for us to be sanctified. So let's read this again. For it's the will of God for your sanctification that you must, what? Abstain from sexual immorality. What sexual immorality? The whole big list. It's sex 
between a male and a female in the context of marriage. This is tough because we love people and we know people who are in um, sex outside of marriage. They live together. They do all, and we love these, these people. We do ministry sometimes uh, alongside. They're coming into the church. Why would God write this to a church in Corinth? Because this was rampant. Their even story right at the front of this book where a stepson is having uh, relations with his stepmother. In the church, not outside the church, in the church, right? This is happening with people in the church. So we're in the process of being sanctified, and one of the things that we get, one of the major convictions that we get from God is in the area of sexual immorality, because you know why? It is the will of God. He didn't make you immoral. He knows you're going to be immoral. He knows you're going to struggle with morality. He knows that all of us will at almost every age. It's around us constantly in this broken world. He knows that about you. But he didn't make the broken world. He made it perfect and we broke it with our sin. And we continue to do so. And people grow up in horrific situations. But the will of God is for your process of sanctification. You're being set apart. So why your ministry could grow? Well, that's why we say serve your family, grow your ministry. Why? Because you're going to be in this part where, where you're going to be convicted uh, by God. And, and one day you're saved and, you're, and, and here's where you're at in your faith. Maybe you're like a five. Maybe half the time you feel good and half the time you go, and you know you're in sin. And then pretty soon you're going to move over to and seven and you're being sanctified. Do we understand this? If I read the Bible correctly, my sinful nature will have me always wanting. I want material things. I want unforgiveness. I want um, my anger to cut loose. I want these things. I want punishment for others. Some people get extreme in this, and they're like, yeah, they want punishment for others so much they become a murderer. Did God make them that way? No, they chose that way in the broken world, and God doesn't want them to continue in that. He wants them to continue in forgiveness. I want sex before marriage. I want sex outside my marriage. I want to put others down. I want to covet everything that everybody else has. I, in the world, I want all these things, but did God make me that way? That's ridiculous. God did not make you that way. God's will for you is to become, he knows you're going to be that way. God knows you're going to be this way. God's will for you is what? The process of sanctification being set apart in his holy word. For his holy kingdom, because God is holy. So expect us to strive for holiness. Now, are you holy? Yeah. Your spirit is set apart. Are you becoming more holy? Sanctified? Yes, you are. Every time I make a decision to change part of my life for Christ, I'm becoming sanctified. I'm becoming more set apart. I'm being saved. I'm being transformed and renewed. And the Bible uses this language over and over and over. It's like, can we get it? Sometimes we can't. What's God's will? Your sanctification, my sanctification. Being set apart to show him that I'm not the world's, to show the world, listen, to show the world there's nobody who would be here listening to me talk if I wasn't set apart in, in this area of my life, if I was immoral, if Amanda was immoral, if, if the leaders of the church are immoral, listen, they need to step down. Why? Because you, they're, they're, they're not striving in the way that the Bible calls them to strive. They're just not doing it. In 1 Peter 2.11, it says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lusts, Why does God want this for you? Because it wages war against your soul. Remember, we just talked about being sanctified. Let's do some Bible study. What's your soul, your thoughts, your hearts, your emotions? What does sexual immorality do to to, to people? Why don't we want to see them caught up in it? Because the Bible tells us, and we believe it, that it wages absolute war against your Holy Spirit-driven soul. That's why. And you can live in it for a long time. And you can bounce back and forth in the Christian life. Oh, I don't want to do, but I want to, and I don't. And, and you can go in that, and, and you'll fail over and over, and, and, and you have. Some of you have, and, and you're frustrated with it because you've never followed God's word to fast and to pray, and, to, and just to, every time we're struggling, to read and have God's word written on our heart. And even if you do that, there'll still be a process of being set apart. And, and if you give into it, it's going to wage war against your soul. Your ministry will become useless People won't be able to respect you. People won't hear you. And you'll be conflicted and you'll feel pretty soon you're going to feel bad. You're going to feel shame. 
And our job is not to shame people who already feel ashamed, but it is, it is to teach the truth. And so we're teaching that in what love and gentleness this morning with accurate Bible study that says, listen, this issue of sexual immorality, all of it, will, if you, if you ignore it, if you give into it, it'll wage war against your soul. It absolutely will. So what does sexual sin do for a Christian? It wages war against being set apart. It decreases your desire for God. Uh, you'll feel shame. You probably at some point may not even care about the growth of God's kingdom, at least not more than your immorality. And God's kingdom may not grow in your life. No one will be able to hear you. It's possible. You'll, you'll look like a hypocrite. So what do we learn if I struggle? What do you learn if you struggle in this area? You find yourself on the wrong side of the teaching of the Word of God? Well, we, have, we know from last week we have to fast and pray and read God's Word. We have to believe it. We have to get used to living in God's promise and stop exchanging it for temporary and start exchanging temporary for eternal. What's that process called? I hope the Bible study helped you this morning. That's called sanctification, right? But we don't use that word. Nobody goes, hey, Austin, how are you doing this morning? Being sanctified? I don't, I don't use it. So we gotta learn, we got to learn together. We have to be, you know, what, what, am I being convicted? Is God telling me in my heart, I know I'm supposed to make changes? Yeah, that's being sanctified. I'm learning how to be set apart. No one knows how to do that. When you come to Christ, you read God's word. We read God's word. We have God's living word who is God right? It's special. And it starts changing our heart through the power of the Holy Spirit so we can be sanctified. No, God didn't make us this way, but he's transforming and renewing. And he also bought us in that condition for a price that cost all his blood. So we have to get used to living in God's promise and stop exchanging it for temporary, a temporary lie that actually leaves us in the gutter and wages war against our soul. It's the, the words of the Bible that can't be denied. Well, today, like last week and in this series, we're going to do communion. And if you, if, if you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please take communion this morning. But we're going to do two things instead of one. First of all, I want you to obey Christ and remember him in this uh, communion. Right, we remember him by putting God at the top. Growing his kingdom is our first priority. How do we do that this morning in a sermon series? By taking the area of sexual immorality that we have and giving it to God, trying to become more sanctified under him in his presence with the other believers this morning. So we pray for that. We can pray corporately or privately. It, it makes no difference to me. But then also, can we care about other people who we know that this is a central issue in their life, as we go back to our chairs and uh, the God-inspired, Holy Spirit-inspired worship goes on, let's take a moment to pray and to care about, now that we've heard Scripture, people that we know are hurting, and this is waging war against their soul. Let's go, to, let's go to prayer. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your Scripture. We thank you for... Um, just making us holy, set apart. We know that this is a big issue, Lord, because everyone deals with it. We love people, so we come with this uh, subject and topic and, and gentleness and love. But, Lord, it, it hurts because the process of coming out of this world that you bought us for a price, it's a change and sometimes change is uncomfortable. Sometimes change, hurt. we have to grow. We have to deny the lie of the world and replace it with your eternal truth. Lord, help everyone across the line, church, at all three services, choose. Help them choose to obey your word corporately so that their ministry can grow. Lord, also, as we go to prayer this morning, help us be selfless by praying and caring about someone who is struggling whose soul has war against it because of this issue of sexual immorality. We pray this in the mighty, more mighty than sexual immorality. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus, amen.